Good morning. Uh, happy National DNA Day. Really? I'd love to take credit for this beautiful timing. But uh, the fate intervened. So uh, this is National DNA Day. If you go on the website of the National Human Genome Research Institute, our key sponsor for this event at NIH, you'll see more. Uh, welcome to everybody here in the auditorium and our many wonderful audience members online. I'm Susan Wolf. I'm chair of the University of Minnesota's Consortium on Law and Values in Health Environment in the Life Sciences, the sponsor for this event today. Uh, I'm also one of the three principal investigators on the NIH-funded grant that brings us here today. Uh, LawSeq, uh, L-A-W-S-E-Q, uh, a project, a three-year project funded by the National Human Genome Research Institute and the National Cancer Institute at NIH to really wrestle the law of genomics to the ground. How's that for a mission? We said it slightly differently in the grant proposal. But as we've engaged our wonderful working group, you're going to hear from many of them over the course of the day and, and dialogue with them. It has begun to feel a little bit like wrestling to the ground. And I think we've made great progress and we're really here today to ask for your feedback, for ask you to help us with this project. Uh, to present to you our work in progress. Tomorrow, the project meets behind closed doors to really digest what you tell us today. Those of you here and those of you online, I'll, I'll tell you more about how our online audience can participate and we really want you to participate. Um, we need your help. We need your feedback. And we need your critique, uh, as well as your endorsement, if you agree with parts of it. That's the whole goal of today. Um, the other two principal investigators for this are Ellen Clayton from Vanderbilt University Medical Center and Francis Lorenz from our institution here. Uh, their bios are online. I think you also have their bios. Uh, this has been a fabulous, very interdisciplinary effort, and we're going to tell you more about that as we go. Uh, National DNA Day commemorates two things. I was talking with Jim Evans, our first keynote speaker, about this. Uh, one of them happened 66 years ago, though Jim tells me not exactly 66 years ago today, which was the discovery by Watson and Crick of the structure of DNA, the DNA molecule, in 1953. The other, much more recent, the completion of the Human Genome Project, first the draft in 2001, and then really a more complete version in 2003. And it's a reminder, 2003 is only 16 years ago, how far we have come in moving from genetics the study of single genes or small groups of genes to genomics, where now we are talking about and seeing integrated into clinical care very large-scale analysis of the human genome up to whole exomes and even whole genome sequencing. This is a huge challenge for law and policy. Law doesn't move that quickly. As you know, you know, a lot of subjects that are taught in law school, uh, probably the poster child for this is property law. They are ancient domains of law. One of the fun things I think about learning property law is all this medieval terminology. It's sort of Game of Thrones law brought up to the present. This is the opposite. This is incredibly fast-moving, newly emerging technology and patterns of analysis, clinical care, evolving industries, direct-to-consumer, 
what should law be doing? What should our regulators be doing? The Food and Drug Administration, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, um, the Federal Trade Commission, looking at fraud and abuse and misleading advertising. I mean, this is a huge challenge at the state level, at the federal level. It's also a huge challenge for our professional societies, racing to really issue evidence-based sound guidance. There are a lot of players in this space, as many of you know. I've actually looked down the list of everybody registered, in person, online, wow. There's incredible expertise. And so, as I said, we are counting on you. Uh, I have a couple thank yous, and then I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Dr. Doug Gee, to give a little more formal welcome. Uh, this project is, a, a, I think, a very brave and forward-looking visionary project for NIH to have funded. You know, there's a whole domain, many of you know this and you participate in this domain of work that uh, NHGRI has championed, but it's really across all of NIH, ELSI work, E-L-S-I, ethical, legal, and societal issues. And this is really about the L in ELSI. This is a deep dive into this. I think it is the most comprehensive dive that NIH has funded, looking across four key domains, as you're gonna hear. The liability challenges, the quality challenges, how do we uh, really do our best to ensure the quality of genomic analysis and interpretation, the privacy challenges, something very front burner today as people look at things like the use of public, public uh, genomic databases and genetic databases to solve cold crimes, cold cases like the Golden State Killer. And there's an article even in today's New York Times about this. Uh, and then something we've called framework, which is kind of a meta problem, which is law conventionally is siloed. There's the law of research, the law of clinical care, the law of public health, uh, and even the emerging commercial law of direct-to-consumer. But genomics isn't like that. As you know, genomics blends these domains. It straddles domains, which creates very big questions. So which law of consent governs? Which law of liability or accountability governs? And so we've got a fourth group looking at that. Um, I have a, uh, a couple thank yous I want to acknowledge. Where is Jean McEwen? Up there? Right there. Dr. McEwen, JD, PhD, very long time leader and program officer at NHGRI. Uh, thank you is a little bit too mild, Jean. Uh, it was really Jean that Ellen and I first approached to brainstorm about the possibility of this project. We wouldn't be here without Jean's longtime leadership and her encouragement. And I just wanted to say thank you. <laughs> We're also grateful to somebody who I believe is online, Charlize Kagaanen, who is a program officer at the National Cancer Institute actually did her schooling here, her law school schooling, and uh, is also a lawyer, and has also been a really visionary supporter. The bulk of our funding has been from Genome, but important funding has been from the National Cancer Institute. So up there in the ether, Charlize, thank you. And I also wanted to thank Dr. Dave Kaufman who has succeeded uh, Jean in the role of our program officer at NHGRI and has been a source of tremendous guidance and support. As those of you who do this kind of work know, you don't, you don't do it without that kind of guidance and support. And there have been others from NIH who have been enormously helpful along the way we'll acknowledge as we go. Okay. Uh, 
Let me just do a couple more things and then turn it over to Doug. Um, I need to thank our incredible staff because again, we, I mean, literally would not be here. The project wouldn't have happened. The conference wouldn't have happened without their help. Audrey Boyle has been our senior grants manager at uh, the University of Minnesota in the consortium, has been kind of the rock. Yes, people are nodding in this project, without whom nothing happens. And uh, I just have, uh, again, thank you is kind of too pale a word. Catherine Grimes, our communications specialist and director, has really led a part of this project to build an online searchable database that we're gonna talk more about that is going live today at lawseek.umn.edu that is the first public resource that lets you comprehensively search US federal law, US state law, divide it up so that you can get what you're looking for and has also a free bibliography, all free, all public, all we're gonna keep updating it. And, uh, and also we want your feedback. Something as complex as that has taken a lot of Catherine's time working with Creed Interactive, a web firm, and a fleet of incredibly talented student research assistants. So we're very indebted. And Tracy Mavitz, who has joined us a little bit more recently, has really become another mainstay of this project. And if you have a chance, thank them. They're out there. They're eager to help you in any way you need. So join me in thanking them. We have other wonderful staff partners at Vanderbilt. I'm gonna let Ellen do that piece of the puzzle because that's her neck of the woods. But this has really been a genuine partnership between Minnesota and Vanderbilt. Okay, quickly, disclosures. A summary of disclosures as usual for our speakers, moderators, and planning committee is available on the slide. So you've seen it, those of you here, it's going to be at the registration table also. But uh, disclosures include quickly Mark Barnes, who you're gonna hear from from Ropes and Gray. Grant research support includes Pfizer, Takeda, J&J, &J, Amgen, Biogen, Coa, Novartis, Alexian, uh, GSK, and he's a partner at Ropes and Gray. Uh, Ralph Hall, who you're gonna hear from, a professor of practice here at the U in the law school as a consultant. He's a principal at Levitt Partners. Michelle Penny, who you'll hear from too. Dr. Penny is Senior Director of Translational Genome Sciences at Biogen and a stock shareholder in Biogen, and there are no other disclosures. We are, in addition to webcasting, videotaping today. Please silence your devices, uh, because as the consortium always does as a part of a public land-grant institution, we will post that online for free public access. Use it, share it, teach with it, uh, please. Um, and that'll be up within about two weeks. So for those of you getting continuing education credits, CME, CLE, other, if you're here in the room, uh, you need to sign in at the registration table to make sure you're getting your continuing ed credits. If you're online, you need to send an email now or when you join to consortm at umn.edu. That's us. That's also the email, by the way, you need to uh, send a message to if you have a question, if you have a comment during the course of the proceedings. So please use it. But for continuing ed, sign in there. You're gonna to need to complete a participant credit tracker form and an evaluation form. So that's three things, remember. All three, because we want everyone to get the credits they need. And for other healthcare and veterinary professionals, you can submit a statement of participation to your appropriate accrediting organization or state board for consideration of credit. Okay, last thing. We take evaluations really seriously. I hope that all of you will just take a few minutes. You'll get them by email. We read every single one, and then we discuss them. It's that real. So give us your feedback. We tweak, we change. Let us know what you think. Okay, I think that's it. 
Uh, and it's now my enormous pleasure to introduce uh, briefly my colleague, Professor Doug Yee, uh, who's going to offer welcome. I just want to give you a sense of why it's so appropriate to invite Doug up here to give that welcome. Uh, Dr. Yee is director of our cancer center here at the University of Minnesota, the Masonic Cancer Center. And as many of you know, oncology has really been a leading domain of medicine in terms of integrating first genetics and then genomics. Uh, that cancer center is designated a comprehensive cancer center by the National Cancer Institute. He has a joint appointment as professor of medicine and professor of pharmacology. Um, and he holds the John Kersey Chair in Cancer Research. So as director of our cancer center, Doug is really point person for all cancer uh, work that goes on here, research and clinical care at the University of Minnesota. And he also is an active clinician who treats patients with breast cancer and conducts research to improve cancer therapies. Doug. Thank you, Susan, for that very kind introduction. So um, I would like to speak to you today in my role as a physician. So I'm a breast cancer medical oncologist. I see patients in clinic, and the most important decision for me to make with the patient is to understand am I prescribing the right therapy or not. For me, my practice and the whole practice of breast medical oncology has been revolutionized by genomics. We now have multiple gene tests. 21 genes, 50 genes, 13 genes, two genes that have been commercialized. We can order them for our patients that we see, and we can make a decision as to whether or not this patient needs chemotherapy or this patient has, will be uh, appropriately treated with hormone therapy only. Um, for us, that has been changed our practice and has been extraordinarily important in what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, I need to say, uh, that road was a little bit rocky in the beginning of genomics. I think probably many of you are familiar with the situation that occurred at the institution very close to Dr. Evans, uh, where a genomic profile was put out as predictive of response to chemotherapy and turned to be based on fraudulent science. So that had uh, tremendous repercussions for the field. I like this little picture of the gear, uh, the gear showing regulation. I don't think that the FDA paid serious attention to these new tests until that happened and introduced a whole new concept of, in our world of science, whenever we put a grant in, we had to show rigor and reproducibility. The test that was developed at Duke was based on a basically fraudulent science, which happens. But the bad part of that, it was translated and patients were being assigned to specific therapies based on data that were wrong. So this is an incredibly important field for us and for, for um, oncology and for medicine in general. The field of anything is expanding. Um, there are new genomic techniques and assays that occur almost on a daily basis uh, that can be applied. And uh, you know, just the last comment I'd like to make, I talked about measuring genomics in tumors, but of course we measure genomics in people too. So that has revolutionized our field, the ability to identify patients with hereditary risk. And I also think probably most of you know that this was uh, a patent was held by a single company uh, to do those tests. That patent was overturned in, by the Supreme Court in I think around 2013. And that also has changed the landscape because now many companies are available to offer these tests, including at home tests. You know, 23andMe was the first one to show this, but there are other companies who do this on a more comprehensive basis. So we need help from our legal colleagues on how best to manage these uh, this water and the kind of the new area of genomics, uh, genomic profiling, and it's, uh, it, the good part or a part about this is going to get worse. Uh, there's going to be proteomics, there'll be lipidomics, there'll be metabolomics. All of these tests will be used for our patients, and we'll have to have more legal guides, regulation rules, and guidelines to how best to use them. So thanks again for coming. Thanks for me, allowing me to say a few words, and I'll turn it back to Susan. <laughs> 